E.B. and Barbara Long's monumental The Civil War Day by Day reveals that there were 10,455 military events during the American Civil War. Here's a few examples selected from the 16 classifications they used. There were 79 captures, 727 expeditions, 6,337 skirmishes, 76 major battles, and 29 campaigns. No surprise that Virginia was the stage for the most military events. Though Tennessee was second, most students of the conflict are more aware of those events that took place in the Eastern Theater. However, for this episode, we take you west to the Trans-Mississippi, to an active theater of the war that may surprise you. The statistics bear me out. The third most active state for Civil War events was Missouri. Fourth was Mississippi. And the fifth serves as our stage today, Arkansas. For this episode, we recount a clash that may well have slipped under your Civil War radar. A two-day fight which produced profound consequences. Today, we make our way to northwestern Arkansas, to Elkhorn Tavern and the Battle of Pea Ridge. The last five letters of history spell story, and that's exactly how history should be taught. Numbers and dates have no soul. Such presentations fall flat, for history is alive and relevant. Welcome to Threads from the National Tapestry, stories from the American Civil War. This series will feature events and people from that period and will strive to make you feel as if you were there to show that history is indeed a story. By the end of 1861, the struggle for Missouri was at an impasse. Federal forces held St. Louis and the Missouri River Valley. Secessionists held Springfield in the southwestern corner of the state. Confederate victory back on August the 10th at Wilson's Creek allowed that. However, with an eye on expanding federal control in the state, enter on November the 19th, 1861, Major General Henry Halleck. Immediately, he received pleas from Kentucky and Tennessee for reinforcements. But old brains, as he was called, was hesitant to send troops to either state for fear that the secessionist-minded Missouri State Guard might then move on St. Louis to rid slave-holding Missouri of the Confederate military menace. On Christmas Day, 1861, Halleck gave Brigadier General Samuel Ryan Curtis command of the Union Military District of Southwestern Missouri. Curtis was an 1831 graduate of West Point and had been a civil engineer, an attorney, railroad entrepreneur in Ohio, and a veteran of the Mexican War. In 1856, he, a Republican, represented Iowa in the U.S. House. At decade's end, he was a Lincoln man and opposed to secession and slavery. Fifty-six years old at the time of his appointment, he was methodical precise. He wanted distinction, but was too proud to promote himself for it. Though a military man, he had a sensitive side as well. He loved wildflowers and was an amateur poet. Setting up his Trans-Mississippi Command, he made his headquarters at Rala and designated his force as the Army of the Southwest. Several of his officers were foreign-born, In fact, just over half of his force was foreign-born, most German. The rest of his army was primarily made up of men from Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, and Ohio. One of his foreign-born lieutenants, Brigadier General Franz Siegel, should be noted. Before the war, he had been superintendent of schools and a leader of the German community in St. Louis. Back in his native Germany, Siegel claimed he led German troops in three battles during the German revolts of the 1840s. He failed to mention that he lost all three. 
Siegel felt slighted when he learned he was not slated for overall command of the Union Army of the Southwest. But Halleck talked him into accepting second in command. For the coming campaign, Siegel was given charge of the Army's 1st and 2nd Divisions. Subordinate to him, the first was under another German, Colonel Peter J. Osterhaus, and the second under a former Hungarian nobleman, Brigadier General Alexander S. Asbath, who had been heavily engaged in the Hungarian Revolution of 1848. With so many men foreign-born, yes, there was tension with native-born Americans. Regardless, Washington City approved a federal campaign in the first half of January 1862. The great concern, Missouri's weather, which at that time of year was unpredictable. There could be sudden blasts of snow, sleet, biting wind, and bitter cold, followed by spring light muddy thaw. Their march to the southwest from St. Louis would follow the only real thoroughfare in that part of the country. The telegraph, or wire road, which had been built in 1838 to connect frontier forts with St. Louis. On January the 13th, 1862, a Monday, the Pea Ridge campaign began when Curtis marched his Army of the Southwest out of Rolla. It numbered 12,100 men, but soon dwindled as men had to be left as garrisons in each occupied town. Awaiting them, the pro-Confederate Missouri State Guard under 53-year-old Major General Sterling Price Another veteran of the Mexican War, Old Pap, was popular, charismatic. Military speaking, he was just average in terms of strategy. He was below average in administration and tactics. However, when he learned a federal army was headed his way, he sent word to 50-year-old Brigadier General Benjamin McCulloch, who was down in northern Arkansas. Now, McCulloch was a real frontiersman. A few years earlier, he had survived the measles. Had he not been down with them, he would have been with Davy Crockett at the Alamo. He did fight alongside Sam Houston at San Jacinto. McCulloch had served in two Congresses, the Republic of Texas and the U.S. House. In addition to his colorful past, he had been a 49er and a Texas Ranger. Unlike Sterling Price, he was a solid administrator, tactician, and strategist. Both Sterling Price and Ben McCulloch were well-liked by their men. The problem? They didn't like each other. At all. To Price, McCulloch was too rough around the edges. Conversely, McCulloch thought Price overbearing and pompous. And then there were differences, militarily speaking. As to the coming fight... Price saw opportunity for liberating the state of Missouri. For McCulloch, a chance to defeat an enemy of the Confederacy. Even by the end of 1861, their great distaste for one another was common knowledge, and it affected Confederate decision-making. Both operated within the district of the Trans-Mississippi, which fell under General Albert Sidney Johnston's massive Western Department. That officer, fully aware of the conflict between the two, needed a solid district commander, and therefore Johnston selected Major General Earl Van Dorn, a native Mississippian and a grandnephew of Andrew Jackson. He would lead the counteroffensive to Curtis's Union campaign. Van Dorn was 41, a West Pointer, and a member of the Magnolia State's planter aristocracy. Another Mexican War veteran, he listed among his friends Jefferson Davis. Wiry, dashing, he was quite the ladies' man. Another officer who joined him was a six-foot, 300-pound brigadier general with shoulder-length hair, Albert Pike. Born in Boston, he was quite eccentric, and that at the time made him a perfect Arkansas frontier politician. Under him, a most unique force from nearby Indian territory, he had recruited Cherokee, Choctaw, Creek, and Chickasaw. 
Back to the fluid military chessboard. In mid-January of 62, Sam Curtis had first to deal with Price, who was in his immediate front. That, however, did not keep Curtis from occupying Springfield, Missouri, on February the 13th, 1862. Aware he needed assistance, Price retreated southward to find it. That retreat, Thursday night of the 13th, was made under dire circumstances. Rain, sleet, and snow tore at them, and despite of those conditions, Curtis pursued. So much so that Price and his force were driven out of Missouri and into northwestern Arkansas. In atrocious conditions, they fell back 50 miles and did so in only 36 hours. With his bands blaring appropriately the Arkansas Traveler and time-honored Yankee Doodle, Curtis relentlessly pursued and crossed into Arkansas on Monday, February the 17th. At a spot known as Little Sugar Creek, the Union campaign morphed from pursuit into active combat, the first Civil War fight in Arkansas. Samuel Curtis had cleared Missouri of Confederate presence, but ironically, his drive was the catalyst to unite the two largest Confederate armies in the Trans-Mississippi, and the threat forced Price and McCulloch to have to work together. With Van Dorn still in transit, things didn't start well. Price wanted to hold their present position. McCulloch thought falling back another 30 miles was best. However, when both learned that Curtis Federals were trying to turn their left flank, the decision to fall back was made. It began the 19th, and once again in horrid conditions, this time ice. They reached Fayetteville, Arkansas, the next day. It was an ugly scene, for hungry, unruly soldiers ransacked the town. Retreat continued the 21st, right down Telegraph Road, south toward the ironically named Boston Mountains. All the while, the two Confederate officers bickered. It got so bad that Price refused to speak or even write to McCulloch. So bad that Price actively tried to undercut McCulloch's authority. Meanwhile, Curtis advanced. Dealing with the same lousy weather as his enemy, he forged straight ahead via Telegraph Road to a place known as Cross Hollow and toward the Confederate left. Now, mind you, pursuit is as challenging as retreat. Since Curtis's campaign began back on January the 13th, some 1,000 Federal horses and mules had broken down. Hundreds of men were barefoot. All that forced Curtis into a decision. Move forward to the Boston Mountains, retreat north to Springfield, Missouri, or hold his ground. He opted to hold. Meanwhile, Confederate District Commander Earl Van Dorn was still on his way. From eastern Arkansas, he had some 200 miles to cover. On his second day out, he crossed the Little Red River in a dugout canoe. It capsized, and he was thrown into icy water. Not changing out of his wet clothes, he pushed on. As you might imagine, a high fever followed. On the 1st of March, it was a sick Earl Van Dorn who took command. He named his force the Confederate Army of the West. Meanwhile, Curtis had spread his troops. His left was at Cross Hollow and his right near Bentonville, Arkansas. When Van Dorn learned that Curtis had divided his army, he saw opportunity and issued marching orders. His men were to carry only their weapon, 40 rounds, three-day rations, and a single blanket. For the men of Sterling Price, this was quite a reversal. After days of retreating south from Springfield, Missouri, now orders to go on the offensive. Van Dorn had total some 16,000 men and 65 cannon, a 3-2 to two advantage in manpower and 4-3 to three in artillery. Yet, Mother Nature once again entered the equation. As the day progressed, a blizzard and howling wind. Despite the conditions, from the cover of the Boston Mountains and onto the Springfield Plateau, Van Dorn advanced. 
He halted at Fayetteville to rest his men. But without tents and in bad weather, one has to wonder how much rest they truly got. The next day, Wednesday, March 5th, they advanced under snow showers. After two days of forced marches and unchristian-like weather conditions, Van Dorn had his men 12 miles south of Bentonville. That night, most of his men ate the last of their three-day rations. Across the way, Curtis, aware of the Confederate advance, moved to unite his divided army. Thus far, Curtis had been the hunter. Now he was the hunted. He began to concentrate between Little Sugar Creek and Cross Hollow. Using the telegraph road that ran essentially north-south as a point of reference, he wanted his army to face south. The stage for battle was being set. The clash would need a name, and two geographical points lent theirs. Two miles to the north, a place known as Elkhorn Tavern, and to locals, the surrounding area was known as Pea Ridge. Responding to Curtis's call to come together, one federal unit's effort was one of the war's greatest. It was Colonel William Vandiver's brigade. His Iowans and Missourians moved 42 miles in just 16 hours. However, one part of the federal force under Siegel continued to sit at Bentonville, and their isolation made them a target. Confederate Brigadier General James M. McIntosh recognized that and wanted to bag Siegel and his some 600 men. A West Pointer, class of 1849, McIntosh was a fierce fighter. No one could question his courage, but a heads-down brawler, he was impulsive and reckless. He drove his men around and north of Bentonville in an effort to cut Siegel off from the rest of Curtis's army. More Confederate troops moved to block Siegel's escape route to the east. Sensing the trap, Siegel responded. That Thursday the 6th may well have been his finest day in command, for he pushed his men east where they cut their way out of the Confederate encirclement. That evening, exhausted and hungry Confederates and Union soldiers rested on their arms. They would need to. For earlier, and now Confederate-held Bentonville, Van Dorn called a council of war. Ben McCulloch wanted to turn the Federal right the next day by using the Bentonville Detour Road. Using that route to reach Union-held Telegraph Road would put Confederates five miles north of Curtis and squarely across his supply and retreat route. Van Dorn checked his maps, assessed reports, and agreed. So enthralled with the opportunity, Van Dorn ordered Sterling Price's hungry and exhausted Confederates back on the road that very night. Meanwhile, Curtis and what men he had in his effort to concentrate were at Little Sugar Creek. It was about dark when Colonel Granville M. Dodge suggested blocking the Bentonville Detour Road. Given permission, the future Union Pacific Railroad tycoon took a brigade, marched north, and they began to fell trees. Those obstacles indeed snarled Price and Van Dorn's night march. It was around midnight when the head of the Confederate column hit Dodge's first roadblock. It took two hours to clear the road, and then there was another two-hour delay when they hit a second roadblock. Van Dorn wanted his men north of Curtis's force by sunrise, but darkness, exhaustion, and the felled trees had created confusion. Straggling. Columns fell apart. Van Dorn had to believe he had lost his opportunity, but when his force staggered to its objective around 7 a.m. of March the 7th, all were stunned, then elated. For there was no Union presence. There had been no response to the Confederate flanking march. Van Dorn still had a chance to cut off and destroy Sam Curtis's Federal Army of the Southwest. Van Dorn quickly acted. He sent couriers racing to get the rest of his force there. He ordered Ben McCulloch's column, which was on its way, to leave the detour road and instead use Ford Road, which was a shorter and more direct route. 
He ordered this even though an elevation, Big Mountain, would temporarily separate Price and McCulloch's forces. Once past that elevation, Van Dorn's divided elements would unite at a local site he chose, which was known as Elkhorn Tavern, so named for a huge set of antlers fixed atop the roof of the rustic place. Friday, March 7th, was clear, cold, windless. It was around 9 a.m. when Sam Curtis became somewhat aware of his precarious predicament. He knew something was afoot, but he needed more information to effectively respond. Was the Confederate flanking march a diversion? Simply setting the stage for Van Dorn's main strike elsewhere? Until he knew more, he still had his men facing south. To gather more information, he put steady and reliable Peter Osterhaus and his division on the move. A little later, around 10.30 a.m., Curtis got a report which confirmed that Sterling Price and his Confederates were indeed north of him, about one mile north of Elkhorn Tavern. With that information, Curtis reacted. By 11 a.m., he had one-third of his Federal Army of the Southwest moving, and was done while Osterhaus continued his probe to the northwest, and another federal column under Brigadier General Eugene Carr moved northeast via Telegraph Road. Though Curtis knew Price's whereabouts, he needed the probes to ascertain Confederate intent. With Union and Confederate troops headed for collision, local landmarks were destined to serve as stages for battle. The broad plateau of Pea Ridge, which gently sloped to Little Sugar Creek, Big Mountain, and a saddle which ran south to Little Mountain. The terrain there, post Black Jack and White Oak, Elm, Poplar, and Red Cedar, and one little hamlet that would soon be caught in the crosshairs of the coming storm, Lee Town. Around 11.30 a.m., Osterhaus's division reached a site known as Oberson's Field. There, he placed a line of infantry along its southern border, and with the rest, probed forward. Then, some 600 yards ahead, through trees and fields, he spotted Ben McCulloch's Confederate column, some 7,000 cold, hungry, and weary men, following Van Dorn's order to join Price. Just before noon... Oosterhaus struck, his artillery raking McCulloch's column. Entering the expanding fray, some 3,000 Confederate cavalry turned right, and fighting began at nearby Foster's Farm. That attack broke Iowan and Missouri cavalry. In the melee, part of McCulloch's command, Brigadier Generals Albert Pike's Native Americans, about 1,000 in number, reportedly began to murder and take scalps. For McCulloch, he had to make a command decision. Break free, move on to join Price as ordered. But if he did so, would he be leaving a sizable federal force in his rear? He chose to commit his men to battle right there. Columns formed into battle lines and pushed forward. Men from Illinois, Missouri, and Indiana made a stand along the length of Oberson's field, and it was there that Federal artillery fire completely mortified Pike's natives. They were done, out of the fight. Nevertheless, to press his advance, McCulloch went forward with his men. Dressed in a black velvet suit, brown hat with narrow brim, he rode alone rode through a mix of brush and trees and paused on a slight elevation. With a cold, clear sky behind him, he made himself the perfect target. Indeed, 70 yards away, skirmishers of the 36th Illinois saw him and fired. A bullet tore through his heart. Isolated, no Confederate saw him fall. However, Company B of the 36th Illinois did, reaching him a private Peter Pelican took McCulloch's goal watch and tugged at his boots. The 16th Arkansas interrupted the degradation. News of the popular McCulloch's death was suppressed. I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone for listening to Threads from the National Tapestry. 
You know, each of these episodes is the result of hours and hours of research and preparation, and it means a great deal to me and our production team to see the likes, the comments, and views. I mean, let me make clear that everything we do here will always, always be accessible to any who are curious to learn about the American Civil War. But we would like to ask you to consider to become a member, uh, a Threads loyalist, if you will. For less than $5 each month, your support will help us to continue sharing our passion for that tumultuous yet important period of history. Joining is quite easy to do. At the top of each show description, you'll find uh, a link, if you will, to join whether you're watching, liking, commenting, or becoming a Threads loyalist. If you click on that link, your support for Threads from the National Tapestry will mean a great deal to me, to our team, and there's no question, any contribution, your support certainly makes a difference, and it's a wonderful acknowledgement for what we try to do. Thank you. At Oberson's Field, Oosterhaus's men had intercepted the Confederate column, delayed and divided its advance. It had also killed their popular leader. Word of McCulloch's death did reach James M. McIntosh, who now in command personally led the 2nd Arkansas Mounted Rifles forward. The same 36th Illinois saw the advance. A Union volley now brought McIntosh down. In the span of about 15 minutes, two Confederate Brigadier Generals were dead. Completely unaware of their deaths, and of the fact that he now was in command, Confederate Colonel Louis Hebert and his men now entered the fight. Bilingual and Acadian, Hebert graduated third in his West Point class of 1845. The Louisiana sugarcane plantation owner ordered his brigade, four regiments, some 2,000 men forward. It was a little before 2 p.m., Unsupported, they entered dense Morgan's woods, although there were a few ball spots where trees had been taken down by a recent tornado. Within, Hebert's man-made storm went in to hammer Osterhaus's exposed federal right. During all this, Curtis, after several recons, correctly determined his threat was to his right and rear and so reacted. What he did is still... Nothing short of remarkable. He changed his entire front 180 degrees from facing south to north. Not just battle lines, but trains, stores, and even his hospital. In six hours after contact, he reversed his entire military front. Militarily speaking, simply stunning. Back at Morgan's Woods, help was on the way in the form of an unlikely named Union officer, a Union officer, Jefferson C. Davis, and his 1,400 men in blue who arrived about the same time as when Hebert formed to make his Confederate attack. Davis's Federals marched onto the field, interestingly enough, with its band playing Dixie. The collision was point blank, and the two tore into one another, but after an hour, numbers began to dictate the outcome. Though Hebert and his Confederates enjoyed some tactical success, Davis and others advanced and held their ground. Hebert's Confederates were victims of confused leadership, and although there were Confederate reinforcements one half mile to the north, no orders reached them to go to their comrades' aid. So while Hebert's men were hit from three sides, whole Confederate units set waiting for orders. No question, it didn't help when finally leaked that McCulloch and McIntosh had been killed. Hebert's men needed leadership, and on a luckless day for Confederate officers, Hebert was now captured. 
While confusion reigned, Albert Pike took nominal control. And between 3.30 and 4 o'clock that afternoon, led a 2,000-man column toward Van Dorn, who was at Cross Timber Hollow. The fight was shifting, and as a result, many Confederate units fought in isolated pockets. The Bears' fight was just that. Essentially abandoned, now they were fighting for their lives. Those who could, those who could disengage, drifted toward Van Dorn's body of men. By the middle of the afternoon of the 7th, Curtis continued to react. He ordered Franz Siegel to move to the fight at Leetown. Curiously, he wanted his two wings to unite at Elkhorn Tavern. It was there at the tavern that earlier, around 10.30 that morning, while fighting was going on at Leetown, Curtis learned that Confederate infantry was moving on him from out of the north, right down Telegraph Road. Responding to blunt that Confederate advance, he called for elements of Eugene Carr's 4th Division to blunt this new Confederate advance. Carr, another West Pointer and pre-war frontier fighter, was an irascible subordinate, but in a fight most pugnacious. He led forward some 1,400 men toward Elkhorn Tavern. Just north of the tavern, the Pea Ridge Plateau ends, and the terrain slopes north nearly 300 feet to a locale known as Cross Timber Hollow. It was there that Carr deployed his men. Assessing the situation, Carr called upon Colonel William Vandiver's foot sore. 2nd Brigade, and refusing to wait for a Confederate blow, Carr opted to inflict one. He attacked and surprised some 5,000 Confederates who were deployed but were tentative about advancing. Carr's men knocked them back on their heels. Confederate response? 21 guns were called up. Carr had only three, and his Federals took a beating. The pounding made worse due to a strange atmospheric and topographic condition that existed that day at Cross Timber Hollow. Rather than dissipate, most of the smoke from the discharged black powder carpeted the ground, creating an eerie, murky fog. These Confederates under Sterling Price had won a tactical success, but unable to see and assess the enemy's strength, Price missed a chance to follow up his success. As it turned out, a costly mistake for Federals, but the high ground around Elkhorn Tavern was still in Union hands. Now, initiative began to change. More men in blue began to arrive on the contested field. One of the first, Vandiver's dog-tired 840 men who answered Carr's earlier beckoning. Despite exhaustion, they went in around 2.30. Though repulsed and outnumbered essentially all day, Curtis and his men continued to stubbornly hold on to the high ground near the tavern. Meanwhile, his counterpart, the usually aggressive Earl Van Dorn, had been anything but this day. As we've mentioned, it had been a very tough day for Confederate leadership. McCulloch and McIntosh were dead. A bear captured. Now, Van Dorn learned that Sterling Price had also been wounded. As any veteran will attest, with changes in command comes friction, uncertainty, and quite likely Van Dorn fell victim to it all. For both armies that day, with all the shifting and isolated fights and divided commands, both Van Dorn and Curtis cannot be blamed for drifting with the fluidity of battle, which turns plans into what-ifs and maybes. As a result of those conditions, the fighting on the 7th hit a lull. Using it to full advantage, Carr compacted his line. As he did, a Confederate unit the 1st Missouri Brigade, attacked, and their limited advance seemed to awaken Van Dorn's aggressiveness, and he determined to shift yet again the orientation of battle. Using his right as a diversion, he ordered his left to move around Pea Ridge and hit Carr and Curtis's exposed Union right flank. Around 4.30 p.m. on that confusing afternoon, some 2,000 Missourians under Price, who, though wounded, and refusing to leave the field, 
now made repeated charges and drove Federals back to a landmark known as Ruddock's Field. There they dug in. If they had not, the door would have been wide open for Van Dorn's men to capture Federal trains to the south. Though Price's late afternoon success was limited, it was significant. It would prove to be, for the entire American Civil War, the high water mark of the Confederacy in the Trans Mississippi Theater. After a day of flanking, of shifting, of isolated attacks and defensive stands, mercifully, around 7.30 that evening, darkness ended the bloodletting. There would be more the next day. That evening, both armies continued to shift yet again. Some 2,000 of McCulloch's Confederates finally arrived on the scene from their fight at Leetown. But though they did, another 3,500 were still separated from the Confederate main body. That night, bitter cold and command concern for the Confederates. Van Dorn's army had been divided for about 24 hours, and during that time, only four messages had been exchanged between the two wings. To repeat again, McCulloch and McIntosh dead, Hebert captured, a usually aggressive Van Dorn indecisive, and when he finally did attack, he lost perspective. To engage with the fight at Elkhorn Tavern on the 7th, he lost sight of his entire army. And one more factor, and it would be a backbreaker. Van Dorn had neglected to get his supply wagons to his men. That night, perhaps one-tenth of his men had anything to eat. Across the way for Curtis, it had been a mixed day. Success at Lee Town, but repulse at Elkhorn Tavern. His enemy was positioned directly across his escape and supply routes, and yet, incredibly, Brigadier General Samuel Ryan Curtis that evening was upbeat. To solidify his line, he ordered Franz Siegel to bring his 1st and 2nd Divisions to Elkhorn Tavern. And in the early hours of March the 8th, there was another reason for Sam Curtis to feel good. Peter Osterhaus continued to hold Wellfleet's knoll, which set 50 feet above the plateau and overlooked the Confederate right flank. As Saturday dawned, Van Dorn's Confederate line, centered on Telegraph Road, stretched a mile in length. Missourians were in front, behind men from Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas, and joined by Native Americans. Last evening, Van Dorn's fever finally broke. Like Curtis, he too felt good, but he shouldn't have. He was unaware that his trains, which had food and ordnance, were hopelessly out of reach. And he was unaware Curtis held an elevated position on his right. Regardless, it was his artillery that opened the second day of battle. He probed with Missourians and Arkansans across Ruddock's field, but many were cut down thanks to Oosterhaus's elevated position. In response, he directed Confederate artillery fire toward the knoll, but nothing like what he could have brought to bear. A curious circumstance that would plague his army all day. Van Dorn had a total of 65 guns. But that Saturday, no more than three of 15 Confederate batteries, only 12 guns, were engaged. Franz Siegel, the man who last evening believed Curtis would have to surrender, had now joined the main body and brought 21 guns, nine more than Van Dorn used the entire day. And so, no surprise here, it was a fine day for Union artillery. Fire poured down on Confederates from everywhere. Shells hit the southeastern corner of Big Mountain, killing and wounding men with shell and stone debris. So devastating was the artillery fire that in one half hour, Van Dorn's right crumbled. Joining the crescendo, U.S. artillery opened up from Ruddock's Field to Elkhorn Tavern. The cannonade over two hours, was the largest sustained on the continent at that time. A conservative estimate 
1,800 shots, 30 a minute, one every two seconds. The roar could be heard 50 miles away. For one of the few times in the American Civil War, a pre-attack artillery barrage actually softened up enemy infantry. When it came, some 10,000 Federals, a mile long, it was magnificent. Under the March sun, a martial spectacle. One of the few times an entire battle line, infantry, cavalry, and artillery were all in the open. Van Dorn needed ordnance, but that was five to six hours away. With his eyes welling up in tears, he knew he was beaten. Van Dorn issued orders for a withdrawal to the east, but that would be difficult. He would have to blunt Siegel's attack, which came around 10.30 that morning, make a stand, and then disengage. Had Curtis struck all along his line, Van Dorn may not have been able to break free. Candidly, Siegel's attack aided Van Dorn, for it actually pushed the Confederates toward their escape route. At 11 a.m., Van Dorn turned his horse east, but there was to be a final Confederate misstep. Even the Confederate retreat was bungled. Countless pockets of men under Albert Pike and 13 batteries around Elkhorn Tavern didn't get the word. They had to cut their way out, not to the east, but to the west. Back to the east, in Van Dorn's retreating column, many believed they were simply on a flank march. A few hours later, they learned the disappointing truth. No flank march, but retreat. Surprise quickly gave way to gloom, then anger. As one Confederate soldier put it, by God, nobody was whipped at Pea Ridge but Van Dorn. They did make good their escape, but it was a bitter one. Of some 13,000 engaged, some 2,000 Confederate casualties, about 15% of the force. Across the way, Curtis was elated. He should be. Under duress, his divided wings had united. The last charge carried out in the open with sun reflecting off polished bayonets was stirring. Flushed with victory, Curtis ordered Siegel to pursue Pike's isolated force, but miscommunication botched the effort. Further pursuit was ordered, but it was too late to be successful. However, in victory, Curtis, with some 10,250 men engaged, 13% of his force casualties, 1,384. On the cold, rainy night of March the 8th, a warm message dot and dashed north from out of the Arkansan Ozarks. It was addressed to Henry Halleck and read, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Ohio, and Missouri very proudly share the honor of victory, which their gallant heroes won over the combined forces of Van Dorn, Price, and McCulloch at Pea Ridge in the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas. For Sam Curtis, tactical victory. Not strategic, since a Confederate army still existed, but strategic as time would tell, for Missouri was firmly now within the Union fold, and even better, Confederate activity in the Trans-Mississippi was for all practical purposes over until 1864. And then, as in most battles, the fallout. And the fallout caught and tugged at both commanders. For the defeated Mississippian, Earl Van Dorn, he wrote a few weeks later, I was not defeated, but only failed in my intentions. He blamed a badly disciplined army, and he believed several accidents entirely unseen and not under my control did him in. At Pea Ridge, truth be known, he had been irresponsible, logistically unprepared, and obsessed with speed and surprise when the elements and conditions advised otherwise. Never developing a staff, he, at Elkhorn Tavern, lost himself in tactical matters, lost sight of his entire army and the big picture. 
In about a month, he was told to bring his army to Corinth, Mississippi. He crossed the Mississippi River, abandoned Missouri and Arkansas, and arrived late. And by doing so, he denied PGT Beauregard of desperately needed Confederate reinforcements at a battle called Shiloh. Transferred to the Army of Mississippi, Van Dorn enjoyed a few successes, most notably at Holly Springs in December of 1862, but his lifestyle and womanizing caught up to him. It was a Thursday, May 7th, 1863. The setting? His headquarters at Spring Hill, Tennessee. A Dr. Peters dropped by and for violating the sanctity of his home, shot Van Dorn dead, dead at 42. For the victorious Samuel Ryan Curtis, he watched as others now tried to rob him of his rightful laurels of victory. Franz Siegel prominently played his role to do that, and he played it to the hilt. And then there was renewed bad blood between native and foreign-born troops, But Curtis rose above it all. As he bravely put it, I can survive it. Of course, in St. Louis, Henry Halleck used the Pea Ridge victory for his own gain. Meanwhile, Curtis kept his army in the field and for the next six months combed Arkansas to keep Confederate forces scattered and in disarray. Promoted to Major General for P. Ridge, he finally rested the Army of the Southwest in Helena, Arkansas, in the summer of 1862. At P. Ridge, he had been simply remarkable. Later, he would command the departments of Missouri, Kansas, and the Northwest. Surviving the war, he negotiated treaties with the Sioux, Cheyenne, and other Plain Indians, and in November of 1865 was appointed to a commission to examine and report upon the construction of the then-fledgling Union Pacific Railroad. It was while he was engaged in that work, he died at Council Bluffs, Iowa, the day after Christmas, 1866. Samuel Ryan Curtis, sadly, and if you will, footnote in Civil War history. He deserves better. And yet, no less an observer than William T. Sherman noted Curtis and his army's contribution in the Western theater when Sherman wrote, Somehow, few men realize the full value of the victories at Pea Ridge, Donaldson, and Shiloh. Though not conclusive, They gave the keynote to all subsequent events of the war. They encouraged us and discouraged our two sanguine opponents, thereby leading to all our Western successes, which were conclusive of the final result. The more you study the Civil War, the more you will discover that the Northwestern states save the Union. Next we gather, we'll take you back to one of the most disturbing days in the history of our democracy. We'll return to April 14th, 1865, and hour by hour progress the day on that fateful Good Friday. For our next episode, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. I hope you'll join us. We'd like to take this opportunity to welcome two more patrons to our kind folk who have appreciated and supported what we're trying to do here. Up in Blowing Rock, thank you so much, David Carr. And down in Fayetteville, North Carolina, Jeremy Cover. To both of you individuals, thank you so much. We appreciate so much your help and your support. This is Fred Kiger. Thank you for listening. Please, in these troubling times, continue to be kind and be safe.